Hey everyone, it's Kenji, uh, and today I'm going to be making ahiyako. Um, so ahiyako is a Colombian potato and uh, potato and chicken soup, um, specifically from Bogota, um, which is where my wife is from. So this is one of the first Colombian dishes I learned how to make from uh, her family, her aunt, her great aunt Gloria. Um, not her great aunt, her aunt Gloria uh, showed me how to make this one of the first times I went to Colombia. So I've, I've been traveling there for oh, I don't know now, 15 years annually. Um, anyhow, very, very simple soup. Um, so potatoes are from the Andes. Uh, and so this, the only difficult part of the soup is that it requires um, a few special ingredients, although you can make substitutions, which I'll tell you about. Um, but potatoes are from the Andes. Um, Bogota is in the Andes, uh, elevation around 8,000 feet. This is a really hearty soup. Um, and, um, <clears throat> you know, it's the kind of soup that when you're working on a farm in the mountains at high altitude um, and you've been working all morning and you're going to be working all afternoon, uh, you'd want to eat this soup for lunch. Um, in Colombia, typically lunch is the, uh, is the sort of big meal of the day. Um, <clears throat> all right, so I've, I've started with uh, chicken, chicken breast, um, an onion, uh, and then a couple of a few scallions. Um, so in Bogota, you would be using um, the, 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 you'd be using a specific type of type of onion that's not exactly a scallion, not exactly um, a round onion. Um, they're called cebolla larga, I think. Um, but um, it's a it's a long onion. So that that's sort of the normal onion. There are these sort of hardier scallion type onions as opposed to the more bulbous um, onions that you'd see in the U.S. But um, you can't find them here. So I use a mix of scallions and regular onions, um, chicken breast. This is chicken stock, just a couple quarts of chicken stock. Um, this is sto uh, store-bought low sodium stock. You can use homemade. Um, now this is one of the unique ingredients that you're going to need. This is the only one that you really need to find. It's called guasca. Um, and it's sort of the e essential flavor of this dish. Um, it's what it's an herb. In the US it's called um, gallant weed or soldier's weed or potato weed. Um, it is a weed and it grows um, invasively here. Um, but you can find it, uh, there's a company called Kishka, K-I-S-K-A, that sells it dried. You can probably find it online. Um, so I'm going to put a big handful of that. Um, normally, I would also add a little, like a bunch of cilantro to this broth, but um, I don't have any cilantro right now, so I'm not going to use it. Plus, my wife doesn't particularly like cilantro, so no big deal. All right, so that's just going to go in the stovetop right now. I'm going to put it in the big burner, actually. That's it. All right, so while that broth is coming up to simmer, oh, I'm gonna throw a bay leaf in there also. Not necessarily traditional, but I like it in there, so I'm gonna do it. In Colombia, you would typically make this out of three different types of potatoes. Um, there's a potato called papa sabanero, which is uh, sabanero, which is a, um, a kind of red, and it's got like a kind of spotty red, purplish yellow skin, um, uh, very dense. Um, and in the US, I would use a red bliss, something like this, a nice dense potato instead. Um, papa pastusa, which is a sort of whitish, yellowish potato. Uh, that has a starchier flesh, so in place of that, I'm going to be using a russet potato. Um, and then finally, these guys, papas criollas, which are these little yellow potatoes that have like a really nice buttery flavor. Um, these ones, you can buy them frozen, pre-cooked and frozen. Um, that's the only way I can find them in the U.S. In Colombia, of course, you can find them fresh. Um, you know, there's like thousands, literally thousands of varieties of potatoes uh, in the Andes. But you can find these frozen um, if you're lucky. If you cannot find them, you know, I would check your Latin supermarket in the freezer section. Uh, if you cannot find these frozen, you can use little Yukon Golds or even big Yukon Golds. Um, but you, um, but these, if you can get them, they really make a do, do make a difference both in terms of flavor and texture. Um, so I'm just going to be peeling these potatoes. So it's weird, you know, just like in the U.S., you know, we have a very long history with apples. And so we have hundreds of varieties of apples in the U.S., available in the U.S., whereas if you go to Colombia and you look for apples, you might find, I don't know, two or three varieties at most in a good supermarket. On the other hand, in Colombia, like at any supermarket, you're going to find dozens of varieties of potatoes, and if you go to like a farmer's market, you, you know, you'll find even more. Um, whereas in the U.S., it's like we basically just get russet, red bliss, and Yukon Gold, sometimes white potatoes also. Um, you know, if you're lucky and you go to a farmer's market, you can get some nice, like, varieties of fingerlings and such. Um, but you really have to seek out special potatoes in the U.S. Um, it's interesting, I think. I mean, I guess that's what makes the world an interesting place to travel around. Um, so why the three types of potatoes? Um, it's 
mainly for a uh, combination of flavor and texture. So some of these potatoes, you know, starchier potatoes tend to break down very easily, whereas um, waxier potatoes, like the Red Bliss, won't break down as easily. And so as the soup simmers, um, some of the potatoes break down and thicken it up, while other ones remain a little bit chunky. So you get this really nice combination of textures. Um, <clears throat> similarly, you get you get different flavors. You know, potatoes, I wouldn't say they're the most varied vegetable in the world as far as flavor goes, but um, you do find a, a very wide range of flavors um, that combine nicely. All right, so once you get them peeled, you don't need to peel the papas criollas, by the way. That would turn a very simple recipe into a very diff difficult one to have to peel um, a whole bunch of teeny tiny potatoes. Um, you just cut them into about, you know, quarter to half inch slices. You don't want to slice them too thin. Um, if you slice them too thin, what happens is that um, the starch washes out of them pretty quickly um, as they cook. And once the starch washes out of them, and I'm not sure about why, but maybe someone can point me to like a scientific paper on this. But um, for some reason, if you slice them too thin and the starch washes out of, out of them, they will never soften. So if you like shred potatoes for hash browns, for instance, or latkes, um, and you um, <clears throat> rinse them, rinse them, rinse them until there's no starch left, and then you try and boil them, you can boil them for like days and they will stay firm and crunchy. Um, which is useful for something like potato pancakes, um, where you want those, want them to stay a little bit crunchy, but a bad idea for a soup like this where you want them to melt. So I'm going to do about I don't know, a pound of these. I'm making like enough for four to five servings. Um, now the last specialty ingredient is mazorca, mazorca, which is a special type of corn that you find in Colombia. So I couldn't actually even find it in any market. This is Peruvian style mazorca, which is similar. Um, these ears are, kernels are actually a little bit bigger and whiter and starchier than Colombian mazorca. Of course, you can find this kind of corn in Colombia as well, but um, the corn that you would use for ajiaco is, um, has big yellowish kernels that are not sweet at all, but they're not quite as starchy as this, um, you know, this super starchy Peruvian corn. Um, but this is the closest substitute I can find, so I'm using it. Um, if you can't find either of those, you can use uh, regular American sweet corn on the cob. Um, American sweet corn takes a lot less time to cook. So with masorca, um, this starchy corn, I'm going to start it cooking with the broth at the beginning. Whereas if I were using um, American sweet corn, I would add it in just for like the last half hour or so. And that is basically all of our ingredients. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let this guy come up to a simmer um, and that will happen just by me snapping my fingers. All right, so we're at a boil. I'm going to bring it down to just a bare simmer. Okay. Um, so now I'm going to basically let this cook until the chicken cooks through. By the way, you don't have to use chicken stock. You could use a little bit more chicken or some chicken bones, and you could actually just make a stock to begin with here, um, and it would be totally fine. You can just start with water, I mean, instead of instead of adding store-bought chicken stock. So yeah, now that's at a simmer, I'm just gonna put a lid on it, and uh, I will be, it'll take about 15 minutes, and I'll be back to you once the chicken is cooked through. So, um, I actually let it go a little bit too long. I think it was about 25 minutes I started. Yeah. Oh, we're perfect actually, right around 150, just where we want it. All right, so you want it to be between like 150, 160. You can let it go higher than that if you if you feel a little bit squeamish about eating 150 degree chicken, but this chicken is gonna get sort of shredded up and then added back in at the end. So I, I recommend trying not to overcook it, oops, because you don't want it to be dry. You know, that said, shredded chicken, it's hard, to, hard for it to stay dry anyway, so it's probably all right. All right, so we're gonna take that, set it in a bowl. Now we're going to remove the uh, rest of the aromatics here, which have mostly given up their flavor. The guascas will add some fresh in, um, but it's okay if some of it gets left behind, obviously. But we just want those big chunks of onion out. And if you had cilantro to here, you would take it out as well. Um, if you are using cilantro, one thing you can do is just use cilantro stems at this stage and then save the leaves because you can use them later on for garnish. 
So the sort of common common tip for using herbs and soups in general is pick the, pick the leaves off the herbs at the beginning, use the stems and the broth, and then save the leaves for garnish so that you sort of extract as much flavor as possible out of it. Now, here comes the real hard part. We're gonna put all these potatoes and this corn right in. I'm gonna top it up with just a little bit more water. Good. Now this one, we're gonna do the exact same thing. We're gonna bring it up to simmer just by snapping our fingers. So that's it. Now I'm just gonna turn this down a little bit. And again, if you were using um, American sweet corn, don't add it at this point. Um, but now I'm gonna turn it down until it's just barely simmering because this is now gonna go for um, a good, you know, two hours or so, you wanna basically cook it until the potatoes are completely broken down. There might be still a few little bits of chunks of those red potatoes especially, but um, the yellow potatoes, the the russet potato and these yellow papakriologists are gonna break down completely um, and they're gonna make this into a nice, rich, thick soup. Um, so when it's done, I will be back and that will probably take about a couple hours. So as you can see, um, I, I topped this up with a little bit of um, extra waters that started to reduce too far. Um, and then I also added another little handful of guascas to it um, about half an hour ago. Um, so this potatoes have mostly broken down. I'm gonna season it with some salt. Um, and you're gonna wanna taste this and make sure that the seasoning is right. You can use quite a bit of salt because <sighs> potatoes love salt. Um, now you might find that there are a few, you know, as you stir it, everything's gonna kinda naturally break down, but let's see. Oh, there we go. You might find that there's like a few kind of bigger chunks of these papas criollas left. And you can just kind of smash them with the back of your spoon against the side of your pot. Um, the other thing you could do is you can take a whisk and go in there if you really, really want to get the potato pieces finer. Um, but this is about, about where I want it. It's looking pretty good. That chicken is now definitely cool enough to handle. So I'm going to take off the skin. Shabby, you want some chicken skin? Here. <laughs> there you go. Take out the bones. And then just shred it up. You can do this with forks, you can do this with your fingers, whatever you prefer. You just want to get into some nice fine shreds. I think there's this popular misconception maybe due to, I don't know, Romancing the Stone or whatever that movie was, whichever the movie was. Um, I think it was Romancing in Stone, which takes place in um, what Michael Douglas calls Cartagena. It's actually Cartagena. Um, but I think there's this popular misconception that Colombia is all jungles and tropicals um, when it's not. I mean, there are parts that are jungles and tropicals, and there's a large portion of the Amazon um, in Colombia. But Colombia has a, is a huge country with a hugely varied um, terrain. Um, so there are mountains where, you know, Bogota is kind of chilly, you know, sort of like fall weather year round, um, a little bit rainy and chilly and windy, um, way up in the Andes and the mountains. Um, and then there are co coastal regions that are very hot, like where Cartagena is. Um, there are huge deserts, there are plains, there's all kinds of, um, there's rainforests, rivers, all kinds of um, landscapes in Colombia and all kinds of uh, variations of cuisine as well. Although most Colombian food tends to be pretty simple, um, simple and good. All right. Um, in the mountains, you find lots of soups like this. And this one is, in particular is sort of like the most typical dish of Bogota. <clears throat> Whereas like the other really famous Colombian dish would be something like bandeja paisa, which is from the Medellin area. I'm um, a little north, northwest of Bogota. Um, and that's like that dish where you have like rice and chicharron, the fried pork belly and the steak and the avocado and an egg and arepas and like all these all these different things all on one plate. And it's called bandeja paisa, which maybe maybe I'll do here someday. The avocado you would use in Colombia is not this type of, these are, you know, fuerte avocados, the kind you would get from Mexico to make guacamole. Um, the, I'm sorry, has, has avocados. The ones that you get in Colombia are the fuerte variety, which are um, not as creamy. They're kind of, um, I don't know, juicier in texture. They're, they're just different, you know? Um, not better or worse, just different. And they tend to go well in soups, but we don't have that, so I'm gonna use this Haas variety. Just slice it up and take off the peels. All right, so let's see what we got here. We get one big chunk of corn. 
So you see how it's become nice and rich and creamy, but there's also some sort of chunks of potatoes. That's how I like it. Of course, you can keep cooking this longer if you want it to stay, if you want it to get smoother, or if you really want to, you could even blend it, but that's that's really not a typical thing to do. So to eat it, you get your corn here. Okay, we're gonna put some chicken in there as well. Um, if you do ever, by the way, go to Colombia, if you're in Bogota, the um, the most famous restaurant where you get this soup, I mean, you can get it all over the city, of course, but the most famous restaurant where you get the soup is a place called La Puerta Falsa, um, which is sort of downtown um, Candelaria region area. Um, La Puerta Falsa, they serve basically just this soup plus some pastries and uh, hot chocolate with cheese, um, and it's delicious. They have it every day. Uh, capers, chicken, I'll put in a couple slices of avocado. We're gonna finish it off with some cream. This is um, suero, which is like a, um, a sour cream, Colombian sour cream. You can use Mexican sour cream. You can use, you can use regular um, you know, American sour cream. If you're using American sour cream, I would recommend thinning it out with a little bit of milk until it has a kind of slightly pourable consistency or you know, not as rich and thick as American sour cream is. Um, and then another typical accompaniment to this that I'm not using today would be um, a simple ahi, which is, ahi is the word for chilies, but ahi is also the word for sauces. Um, so there's a type of sauce called ahi, um, well, many types of sauce called ahi, but um, you could use one, a very simple one made with chopped onions, cilantro, chopped chilies. You could use like serrano or habanero or whatever chilies you want um, with a little bit of salt and water. Um, and that would be a very sort of typical accompaniment to this as well. Fork to eat the corn. Spoon to eat the soup, and we're ready to go. And I'm just gonna take a couple pictures. All right, should we give it a taste? Stir it all up. Oh yeah. Yeah, me. I love this stuff. All right. Hmm. All right, Chubby, do you want a little? Good girl. All right, guys, gals, non-binary pals, this is ajiaco, a typical Colombian dish from Bogota. Um, I hope you enjoyed that, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye. Hey everyone, it's Kenji. There are 22 million kids in this country that rely on school lunches for nutritious meals. And with schools closed now more than ever, organizations like No Kid Hungry can use their support. So I'm asking you to join me. Uh, click the link in the description below to donate some money. No amount is too small or too big. Thank you very much and stay safe. Bye-bye.